Good evening, I'm Robert Polito from the New School Graduate Writing Program, and it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome you to this special Cave Canem reading and conversation with Nikki Finney um, in collaboration with Aracelis Germay. Um, and I want to thank our partners at Cave Canem, particularly Allison Myers and Camille Rankin for their, their friendship and support. And um, if, you've, if you've had the pleasure of going on the Cave Canem website in the last, last few weeks, you'll know that this was an incredibly rich and full march for them. And it's not even National Poetry Month. So um, I urge you to check back in later today and tomorrow and to see what they have coming up um, in National Poetry Month. And the part of the pleasure of working with them is that their, their focus is always on craft and art and history and, and teaching. And um, this is a great occasion, the celebration of Nikki's new book, Head Off and Split. And it's my pleasure now to turn everything over to Camille, who will offer more particular introductions. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Camille Rankin, and I'm the Program and Communications Coordinator for Cave Canem Foundation. For those of you who are not familiar with Cave Canem, Cave Canem is a national organization dedicated to cultivating the artistic and professional growth of African American poets. And since 1996, we've been working to build a home for black poetry in many sites across the country. Um, as Robert said, we have a lot of exciting programs coming out throughout the year and the spring, um, including a reading tomorrow um, at the Brooklyn S Historical Society featuring E.J. Antonio, Aristeles Germay, Rachel Eliza Griffiths, Robin Cost Lewis, Camila Shamoon, and Joanne McFarland. We're also looking forward to Poets on Craft, a reading and conversation with Brooklyn Poet Laureate Tina Chang and Cave Canem Fellow Ross Gay, which will be held right here, April 13th, 6.30 p.m., so I hope to see you there. Um, and you can pick, um, pick up information about us at the table in the back. Um, you can also sign up for a mailing list back there, and you can learn more about us and what we're up to on CaveCanemPoets.org. Um, so I hope you'll visit and find out more about us. I'd like to start out by thanking our hosts and co-sponsors for the evening, the New School for General Studies, and especially Robert Polito and Lori Lynn Turner of the New School Writing Program. And thanks also to our funders, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York Community Trust, Lila Atchison Wallace Fund for the Arts, and the Greenwall Foundation. And of course, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. We're thrilled to be celebrating the release of Head Off and Split, the latest collection from award-winning poet and Cave Canem faculty member Nikki Finney. And she'll be joined by Cave Canem fellow Aracelis Kermai. Nikki Finney is the author of five books, including the recently released Head Off and Split, Poet Kwame Daz says of the collection, with Head Off and Split, Nikki Finney establishes herself as one of the most eloquent, urgent, fearless, and necessary poets writing in America today. Her previous collections include The World is Round, winner of the 2004 Benjamin Franklin Award for Poetry, and Rice, a collection of stories, poems, and photographs, winner of the Penn American Open Book Award in 1999. She is professor of creative writing at the University of Kentucky. Kaveh Kanem fellow Aracelis Kermai is the author of the collage-based picture book, Changing, Changing, and the collection of poems, Teeth, which was nominated for a Connecticut Book Award and received the GLCA New Writers Award. Her second poetry connect collection, Kingdom on Amalia, won the Isabella Gardner Poetry Award and is forthcoming from BOA Editions in the fall. She is assistant professor of poetry at Hampshire College. Please join me in welcoming Aracelis Kermai. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I feel so lucky to get to hear Nikki read and so lucky to have lived with this book um, and to be here today. Um, I'd like to just read, um, I think, four poems. Um, and the first is a poem called Kingdom on Amalia. When I get the call about my brother, I'm on a stopped train leaving town, and the news packs into me freight 
though it's him on the other end now, saying, fine, fine. Forfeit my eyes, I want to turn away from the hair on the floor of his house and how it got there Monday. But my one heart falls like a sad, fat persimmon dropped by the hand of the Turkson's old tree. I want to sleep, I do not want to sleep, see. One day, not today, not now, we will be gone from this earth where we know the gladiolas. My brother, this noise, some love, you I loved with all my brain and breath will be gone. I've been told today to consider this as I ride the long tracks out and dream so good. I see a plant in the window of the house my brother shares with his love, their shoes. And there he is, asleep in bed with this same woman whose long skin covers all of her bones in a city called Oakland and their dreams hang above them a little like a chandelier, and their teeth flash in the night, oh, body. Oh, body, be held now by whom you love. Whole years will be spent underneath these impossible stars. When dirt's the only animal who will sleep with you and touch you with its mouth, Nikki Finney, um, I want to share a poem that I, th I think has everything to do with Nikki Finney um, being at my first Cave Canem. And um, when I turned 13 and I started my period, I cried and cried and cried and was very upset about it in a very serious way. And when I got to Cave Canem, I realized, and Nikki, you, you brought everyone who you worked with, Audre Lorde, uses of the erotic. And um, I realized I never wrote a celebration poem for my period, so this is called 13. Eared, peacock, silver-toothed body of arms, 10 cro toes, crooked hip, farm of cartilage, eyebrows cawing high above red uterus collecting. Follow down there, down to that apple then, that female planet, viscous pomegranate, shade untouched by hands. When you are root and wide enough one day, you open your legs and see that you have turned into a thin blood silk, fire shining red from the vagina, 13 blessed all dragon. This is called To the Child I Met Without Knowing the Story. And um, you'll hear quotes from Sonia Sanchez, Lucille Clifton, Gwendolyn Brooks, Audre Lorde, Nikki Finney. Child, if I had known then when I met you that you were me, if I had known I would have looked for your eyes and birthmarks and at your hands, I would have held you longer and brought you things or taken you on a walk in the garden. I remember roses were growing then and you lay in your mother's arms as she sat in her aunt's house on top of a hill. I would have taken you out there and told you things you might and might not remember but would have heard once. Come here, African, from the beginning of time. I'd whisper, we will wear new bones again. A cardinal is red, a sky is blue. So let us speak remembering, my child, there is reason. Yes, if we meet again, I swear that I will love you. And so love, I mean love, every face that might be yours. This poem is called On Living. What to do with this knowledge that our living is not guaranteed. What could she do? What does one do when the mother's mouth is gone? When the mother closes her eye, the door, but shuts girl this time out. 
Girl wanted words, but there was only sadness for the big and dreadful death. What could she do but swallow loss? The black and tumbleweed of those nights became her home beside her sister. They mother each other still like wolves, like any animal will do, does. Once she's found, she's been pushed or fallen out of the grave to live. They live. There is nothing left to do but live. In this last poem, I wanted to read um, Good Woman, Lucille Clifton poem um, for today. And it's last note to my girls. My girls, my girls, my almost me, mellowed in a brown bag, held tight and straining at the top like a good lunch until the bag turned weak and wet and burst in our honeymoon rooms. We wiped the mess and dressed you in our name, and here you are, my girls, my girls, 40 quick fingers reaching for the door. I command you to be good runners, to go with grace, go well in the dark and make for high ground. My dearest girls, my girls, my more than me. Thank you. I was trying to convince her to come back up with a couple more. Hello. Hi. She said no to me, so. <laughs> she said something about we'll talk about it in the conversation or something. <clears throat> something to put me off. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, look, Cornelius is here. <laughs> Nikki's here. Oh, my gosh. Did Cheryl come in? Cheryl Y. Green, oh, Evie's here. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you, um, New School. Thank you, Kave Kanam. Thank you, all of you, for coming out tonight in this lovely, gray, perfect poetry night. <laughs> I have to tell you a story because um, the main character is here, and she hasn't been here for ever. 25 years, and I, it's just perfect. So Nikki, forgive me, but um, we, we don't often, we don't talk enough for me about, we talk about schools and we talk about MFA programs and we talk about, and those are very important, don't get me wrong. But for me, we don't talk enough about the people who stretch out their shoulders, link their arms, and make sure that if we say we want to be a poet, we become a poet. And I was a junior at Talladega College in Talladega, Alabama with no idea how to be a poet, zero. I only knew that I loved making things with my hands. I had come from people who made things with their hands and I wanted to take that art, that dedication and do the same with words. And at Talladega College, there, we didn't have a lot of people come to visit us. <laughs> we were down in the country, and um, we had an arts festival once a year, and that arts festival meant everything to us. And that's when they imported all the beautiful artists that would tell us things like, you can do this. And so Nikki Giovanni came to Talladega College in that fateful year, and my instructor at the time was Gloria Wade Gales, who was also the wife of the president of the college, oh, an amazing writer uh, of her own. And she made me, a week before Nikki got there, get my stuff together and made me retype all my poems and made me promise that when she came to campus, I would march right up to her and say, I want to be a poet too. And I practiced in the mirror in the dorm and <laughs> all the other girls laughed at me and they were like, you're not going to do that when she comes. So she made me get in the van. I know I'm taking up time, but I'm taking up the time that Araceles could have read a poem, but it's okay. 
So she made me, we got in the van, we drove from Talladega to Birmingham, and we picked up Nikki, and I didn't say two words, and she was trying to make conversation, but I was deathly shy, and was trying to figure out how to get these poems that were under the seat <laughs> out to give to her. And she stayed for four days, and just as we, you know, I was escorting her around campus and showing her the Amistad murals and our 200-year-old oak trees, and she was like, I don't know why this person is here. She's just following me everywhere I go. And so when she was leaving, we took her back to the airport, and I took my sheaf of poems out, and I said, um, these are some things that I wrote, and if you have any time, it would be really, really nice if you could look at them and, you know, give me some feedback or something ridiculous like that. And she took them, and she held them very, very tightly as if they mattered to her. And I watched her walk off with them and get on the plane. A week later, she, a phone call comes to the dorm, Foster Hall, pre-cell phone, big <laughs> phone booth in the hall. <laughs> the phone rings and somebody yells out, Betsy, it's the, you know, your mama's on the phone or something like that. Well, the person answered and said, Nikki, Nikki Giovanni's on the phone. And everybody's head popped out the door. <laughs> And so we were talking silently. What? Get the phone. Get the phone. <laughs> so I go over to the phone, the big phone booth. I climb in. She says one thing to me that I will never forget as long as I live. She said, Miss Finney, my mother and I, her mother was an English teacher at the high school in Cincinnati, have sat at our kitchen table with a big red marker all week and we are sending back to you your work. And underneath all that red is something beautiful trying to happen. I still have that sheath of poems with all those red marks and I am eternally grateful that you took the time, because people don't take the time. People, you know, time is money. And they don't take the time often enough. So I publicly, I've told her this eight million times, but I would not be here today if she and her mother had not taken the time at that kitchen table to tell me what I was doing well and what I was doing not so well. So thank you. <clears throat> this book begins with another quote from another fierce teacher of mine by the name of Tony K. Bambara. And it begins the book, and it says, do not leave the arena to the fools. And it was written on a postcard, and it was shipped from her hospice bed, where two months later she would die. But I have held those words in my heart, and they are the spirit behind the poems in this new collection. Someone asked me just as I arrived, could you tell me about that title? I just, I get, I just don't understand it. And I said, well, if you read the introduction to the book, it sort of tells you a little bit about it. But because I'm from South Carolina, and when I was a little girl, my mother used to send me to the, the fish market on Fridays. It's very simple, really. And you go into the fish market and you take your silver bowl that you get at the door as soon as you walk in, almost like a ticket to the fish market. And you walk along the ice, you know, the, the ice is in front of you and you choose your fish. And w once you've done that, the fishmonger is standing there with his hands and his knife and he says, head off and split. And uh, several years ago, I went home my mother sent me to the fishmonger, as she is wont to do every time I come home still. And he said, his son said that to me, because the fishmonger position had changed. And you never know where a poem lives. But in that moment, I knew that I wanted to do something with that phrase. And I knew I wanted to stretch it out a little bit, make it some sort of extended metaphor for how we're living in these, in these days, in this 21st century. 
And so I chose to think about what we as human beings far too often hand over to other people to do, what we far too often don't want to see the cold, dark eyes and the scale of the fish and the, the gutting that has to happen so that we can enjoy the succulent meat of the, of the fish. And so we can talk a little bit about that more um, in our conversation, but I just wanted to, to do that one thing. So <clears throat> I begin with New Orleans because I will not stop talking about New Orleans because I don't think we're talking about New Orleans enough. But in those days past Katrina, post Katrina, I was haunted by the image of a woman on a rooftop with a sign that said P-L-E-A-S. And there's an epigraph that runs, that begins the poem and then a refrain of that epigraph throughout the poem. And it's eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Rudyard Kipling's A Counting Out Song in Land and Sea Tales for Scouts and Guides, 1923. Left. The woman with cheerleading legs has been left for dead. She hot paces a roof four days, three nights. Her leaping fingers, helium arms rise and fall, pulling at the weak old baby in the bassinet, pointing to the 82-year-old grandmother, fanning and raspy in the New Orleans Saints folding chair. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Three times a day, the helicopter flies by in a low crawl. The grandmother insists on not being helpless, so she waves a white handkerchief that she puts on and off her head toward the cameraman and the pilot who remembers well the art of his mirrored-eyed posture in his low-flying helicopter. Bong Song, Dong Ha, Ple Ku, Chu Lai. He makes a slow Viet Cong dip and dive, a move known in rescue as the observation pass. The roof is surrounded by broken levee water. The people are dark but not broken, starving, abandoned, dehydrated, brown and cumulus but not broken. The 400-year-old anniversary of observation begins again. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, ketcha. The woman with pom-pom legs waves her uneven homemade sign, please help, please. And even if the E has been left off the please, do you know simply by looking at her that it has been left off because she can't spell and therefore is not worth saving? Or was it because the water was rising so fast there wasn't time? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch up. The low-flying helicopter does not know the answer. It catches all of this on patriotic tape, but does not land and does not drop dictionary or ladder. Regulations require an E be at the end of any pleas before any national response can be taken. Therefore, it takes four days before the National Council of Observers will consider dropping one bottle of water or one case of dehydrated baby formula on the roof where the E has rolled off into the flood but obviously not splashed loud enough. Where four days later, not the mother but the baby girl, but the determined hanky waver whom they were both named for and after has now been covered up with a green plastic window awning pushed over to the side, right where the missing E was last seen. My mother said to pick the very best one. What else would you call it, Mr. Every Child Left Behind? Anyone you know ever left off or put on an E by mistake? Potato, potato. In the future, observation helicopters will leave the well-observed south and fly in Kanye West was finally right formation. They will arrive over burning San Diego. The fires there will be put out so well. The people there will wait in a civilized manner, and they will receive foie gras and free massage for all their trouble while their houses don't flood, but instead burn calmly to the ground. The grandmothers were right about everything. 
people who outlive bull whips and bull conner, historically afraid of water and routinely fed to crocodiles, left in the sun on the sticky tar heat of roofs to roast like pigs, surrounded by 40 feet of churning water in the summer of 2005, while the richest country in the world played the old observation game, studied the situation, wondered by committee what to do, counted in private by long historical division, speculated whether or not some people are surely born ready, accustomed to flood, famine, fear. My mother said to pick the very best one, and you are not it. After all, it was only Paul New Orleans, old bastard city of funny spellers, non-swimmers with squeeze box accordion accents, who would be left alive to care. <clears throat> <clears throat> In the back of this room uh, is a young man named David Flores, whom I love and whom I adore, and he's with his amazing poet wife, Ellen. Is the baby here? Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to embarrass David because if you get online, you will see a video of that poem that I just read, and you see that video because of David's amazing work. And David's photographs are actually in that um, film as well, that, that video as well. So this book launch has been so many hands in the circle. And I wouldn't be um, able to talk about this like I'm talking about it had it not been for all those hands. So thank you, David. I was uh, walking home from school one day and I saw um, three black boys playing in the street in the rain. <clears throat> and it made me sad because I began to wonder how much time they had left to be boys before the world um, made them into something else. And so the book that I quote from in, in the beginning of this poem is a, is a really tattered, one of my oldest books, and it's on fossils. And I wanted to be a paleontologist before I, became a, before I thought about poetry. <laughs> and you, I have to keep it together with a rubber band now. It's that old. But it's still a book that I love. And the quote, the epigraph says, there was a time when the shallow, warm seas were filled with coral starfish, and flower-like echinoderms. Some were free-swimming, but most were fixed by a stem, surrounded by a circlet of arms. From Fossils, A Guide to Prehistoric Life. This poem is called Segregation Forever. Three black boys strike oil in the street after the rain, a comic strip. Three black boys hurl like invertebrates to reach the top of the earth wall first. They loose sea lilies cut on their hinge line above thorax, below septum. They fly float with the help of quick feet, skating to peer a new precipice, hoisted in hell by their own giggles. They counterpoint in twain three Picassos without the matador's interfering prick or keening European brush. Oshun's fingers, six million years long, suspend each of their high notes. Three black boy, bodies, dervish, and dangle. Their ancient sound fills every sidewalk crack in the new world. A Benin pointer aligns, then slingshots their heads and lips, while Cuba thumbs drill, then spread wide their toes. The street spider mans beneath them. Where they twist and shout, Pyramids stretch into one long sheet of black water. Carpets of black boy joy spill all the way down. Six plumb paneled perfect arms stretch into six waving sails. Their open mouths, Simone-esque, a red Jemima joy, rose them all the way to the end. 
They play on the 11,000th runway named for Martin Luther King Jr. On approach, they curve away like Onichester, brittle, beloved animal flora from the Mississippian. Eye aperture into prickly 345 million year old net. They are the last great mammals to appear before the last great rain. So far, how we got here, why we stayed, no brownie box jubilation of historical life is ever lost on their feet. My arms twist into barbed 1940s chicken wire, the 26 lion mouth alphabets of Ida B. Wells rise into bail and bill of sale. All along my abdomen, I roll out the patent pending numbers of black inventors. They dangle like Eastern star mason pendants in between their wild fragrant street dance, then fall away like New Orleans Mardi Gras beads. The L's, the E's, even the P's chain link, then spill behind their Watusi wide, Daddy Grace slide. All three together remind me of the Black Rapids of 1919, Tennessee Valley, no warning, just a freakish summer Sunday, breach of river, laying everything down, bringing everything up. From here, I know their rocketing joy must go unrecognized. The good news of their pure monkey shine chicanery must be put away now. All headlines and any waiting New World phylum must never be reported or filed. There, black boy joy on this slick, well-named street must remain untelevised. I know history, and you know what happens next. So, <clears throat> I was in the movie theater, and I had a flashback, and I wasn't really prepared for it, but um, I was watching the March of the Penguins, and the mama penguin has gone off to swim, and the father penguin is standing there waiting 18 million years for her to get back because the hatchling is, like, hungry. You remember this scene? <laughs> so the mama penguin comes over and, you know, hugs and kisses everybody, and then she bends her beautiful neck down into the mouth of the baby penguin. And I have a flashback. I say to myself, my mama did that, sort of. Penguin, mullet, bread. She pulls white oily meat of mullet off the long sharp bones of spine. The bones prick. She never once says, ouch, kissing the tips now and then. I watch her long fingers seven inches away. My eyes are two glossy olives glued to the delicate woman's mouth. It is summer. Behind her, the white curtains she has made move like seagrass, tall, freckled, waving just beyond. I am camera, she is movie. She bites, then rolls, placing plump, soft chunks of fish into the side of her mouth. Her eyes grow big from what she tastes. I study her mouth, not her eyes. Watching her eyes is for later, nighttime, when she will read the day's story to me. She chews slowly, never showing me what's there. Her tongue twists and falls. My dinner moves in slow white fish animation. She coos like a woman who can taste any flavor in the world, a woman who can hula hoop in her own mouth. My hand rises, my fingers reach, fall short, then fall again. I want to say, Mama, pull the flesh from the throat, not the belly. The meat there has more juice than the meat around the fins, but she is the mama. And I have no baby patois for what little I know of watery things. I have only 17 months of new desire and only two ways of showing it. It's too soon to tell her how much I miss my private swimming hole that by the size six looks of her has all but dried up. That story must wait for nine birthday candles. 
She chews down on the flesh of the fish, packs it around good until it is a perfect caramel mush. Catching some of the juice that falls there with her longest finger at the corner of her mouth, she pushes all of the sweet flesh back up inside. Once or twice, she pulls out a hat pin sized bone hiding in the waves of tender meat. Only then does she wear her eureka smile, holding it up in the air to show me my wishful eyes rise. Her long hand is circled in light. My body shifts into question mark. My newish eyes lift over and beyond the white curtains that all visitors believe are store-bought. This is why she says, you have a mama. Her empire backbone finally speaks. Why you must never talk back to me. Why you must love, honor, and obey me. My job, she says, and her toes, pas de deux, is to feed and tell you the stories and keep you away from the sharp things that might slip into your throat and never completely disappear. Her eyes plie into the slinky circles of her mouth. The sweet flesh is finally ground. Salt and snapper, spit and meal are a fine pâté. She reaches her long brown fingers deep inside her jaw, our hinged mouths open, mine prematurely. My fists are flying fleshy verbs in the apple air of her kitchen, bald in sweet anticipation. My chubby legs yoga extend into early orgasmic pose, my chin sets downward facing dog. My begging eyes and dark mauve lips close in slow around her fingers. The pounded succulent fish and spit lands on the center of my tongue. I swell in my first chair ever, fed by the mother who relishes the story of turning her back and leaving me once to swim off a thousand miles, find food, fight off shimmering shark, then swim a thousand miles back to me just to drop her beak into mine. I am the lucky girl of the high chair. Thank you. So um, there's a very long, I, I, I have named it, I've, we've been on tour with this book since the 1st of February. We started in Washington at AWP. And last night I had a reading in Al's Bar in Lexington, Kentucky. And the night before that I had a reading in Little E-Town, Kentucky. And um, when people get the book, there's a, a long, linked, sonnet-like thing not pure, but I call it a radical sonnet. <laughs> and I'm not going to read it tonight, but um, maybe we can talk about that too in the conversation. But it is followed by uh, the Condoleezza Suite poems. And <laughs> I will read two of those. Um, the Condoleezza Suite, Concerto Number 5. Condoleezza and intransigence. At piano, you are a major sound. More than the articulate ivory key, you hear things that aren't there. On nightly TV, you open your mouth to sing. A brilliant delayed count lifts, subsides. We take pride diving through your Shostakovich gap. At news conferences, you and they, cheek to cheek, are guillotined and gutted, prepared, handled, neatly trussed with jade and diamond thread. You are the fifth little girl of Birmingham, found recently with ligature marks beneath high court rulings, excavated with airbrush and Texas-sized picks by not one, but two closely related presidents preserved forever in Washington marble and the panning lights of CNN, 
on display, the ruby carrot curio, fresh from the royally rubble of integration. And the second one, um, I did a lot of reading and uh, research on who Condoleezza is and what she had come from and what she loved. And um, she perhaps still, but then was getting up at four o'clock in the morning and she lived in the Watergate apartment complex, which I thought was very um, <laughs> curious. And she's an amazing concert pianist. And she has, as gift was given by her family, I believe, um, a concert piano known as the Chickering. And so this is called Concerto Number no. 7, Condoleezza working out at the Watergate. Condoleezza rises at four, stepping on the treadmill. Her long fingers brace the two slim handles of accommodating steel. She steadies her sleepy legs for the long day ahead. She doesn't get very far. Her knees buckle, wanting back last night's dream. Dream number nine. She is 15 and leaning forward from the bench, playing Mozart's piano concerto in D minor, alone before the gawking, disbelieving, applauding crowd. Not dream number two. She is nine and not in the church that explodes into dust. The heart pine floor giving way beneath her friend Denise, rocketing her up into the air like a jack-in-the-box of a black girl wrapped in a Dixie cross. She ups the speed on the treadmill, remembering she has to be three times as good. Don't mix up your dreams, Condi. She runs faster, back to the right, finally hitting her stride. Mozart returns to her side. She is 15, again, all smiles, and relocated to the peaks of the Rocky Mountains, where she and the Steinway are the only black people in the room. <clears throat> so, like maybe two more, and um, oh, I have to, I gotta read that one maybe, huh? Yeah, okay. Um, so when I was leaving, I left home my brothers didn't. I left home at 17, and that was okay, but it wasn't really good with my family. But before I left, this was a, there was an old family tradition of um, showing you how to shoot a gun. You just never know where you might need one, I suppose. <laughs> I'm, and I mean that, you know, today if I say that, you, you might get the, a different kind of opinion about that, but we had a hundred acres of farmland and the men in my family thought it was important that I could shoot uh, holes in a Maxwell coffee house can. And no one ever had a gun around, but my grandfather kept one somewhere. And so before they would let me leave them, I had to march, I was marched to the cow pasture and a Maxwell house can was put up on the fence and I was terrified um, because I'd never held a gun before and I thought what in the I'd never seen anybody in my whole family hold a gun but once I read once I got older and once I started reading about the south and traditions in the south and what happened to black girls who left home without their families close around them they were giving me something that they thought I would need. So I started thinking about that and um, I read a book b by Robert F. Williams who was the president of the NAACP in Monroe, North Carolina in 1954. And a lot of us don't know Robert F. Williams because Robert F. Williams called for the arming of the black community, not the peaceful uh, Dr. King way. And it was because there were night riders coming into the community, raping, murdering, doing whatever they wanted to do. So they had to, they felt that they had to do something. There's a fascinating story about his life. I won't go into all that right now, but um, this is called Negroes with Guns. 
The father pulls the six-paneled heart pine door open, leading her out by the arm. First lesson. They wind behind the house, past the prayer trees, beyond the woods, back back of the shed, into the hush-hush air, where prayer and camp meeting rose like jasmine vine, back in the black code days. Their walk together through the fall sun into the old, old woods has been written by carpenter pencil on the wide block insurance calendar for 15 years. Since the day Miss Longfellow, hinterland midwife, left behind one extra long, glistening, brown taffy baby rolled safe and center of the white, white sheet. The escort father moves easy through the loblolly, one hand on his Smith and Wesson, his apple-eyed German Luger sleeps like a cub in his waistband, one hand gentling her shooting arm, never pulling. Her head hawk high, her eyes bog turtle low, her breath full of one last useless resist. Why I have to do what she do? At the speckled breathy chicken wire door stands the one afraid of heights who can blow the X out of the Maxwell House can. Who knows that nothing that comes in twos on her was ever taught to squint? The mother Marks woman, dressed in cotton smock and brogans, stares at the leaving, leaving backsides of the two she would jump out of an aeroplane for. When she practices shooting the eyes out of a carpet beetle, her toes tend to rise, rise, but she cannot swim, fly, leave land with ease. Years later, strangers will arrive at her door and try, try to interview her for their black people who refuse to join King documentary. She will announce at the back, at the back breathy chicken wire of a door to the black, black eye of the camera, what goes on in the backwoods stays on in the backwoods. Turning back to her pots with nary a sound, her trigger finger slick and wet, wrinkled, soapy, content for now, devoted for now to coaxing egg and cheese off a casserole dish. For now, she stops her worry, but not her kitchen worry worry. She hears her first pulse of thunder break, her ears stretch and preen the bright, sure sun and half mile of trees, the feel. She closes her eyes, hoping to see where her two honey buns are going, even before their feet reach the fault lines there. Her brown hands, covered in twice-sifted paprika and goose flour, twitch. The morning has her mindless and stuttering, forgetting her hurricane of work ahead. She touches the itch near her nose. A speckle of whitish wheat will dot her face there. Her husband, the noticer, his hands not even off the copper knob, will reach sweetly for her dark, dark gingerbread of face. She will never realize this errant bloom of white was ever there. She will only care that he returned to her, found something out of place on her, and fixed it. Just like the time before and the time time ahead, how'd she do, she'll ask. Fruit don't run from where it falls, he'll answer. Back in the kitchen, her hands rest on the red cake bowl where the fatty chicken thighs, her daughter's favorite, bob and dive, dive and bob like synchronized swimmers. All you can eat, the Berlin Olympics, 1936. Jesse had already won. Adolf commenced biting at the skin of his pearl white fists. Tanned with fresh garlic, the thighs bubble up and practice sleep inside the silky clabber of milk butter stretching into a colored swan lake. Green settled and woozy woozy collapse inside a steaming bog of pot liquor. At the knotty rusty screen, the mother who can shoot the first and second S from out the middle of grasshopper without browning the grass or decapitating the hop hop stares out into the field of yellowing pine for sign of in insect life or other, other. The trees unwrap, gunpowder lifts every leaf into air, cabbage colored cicadas lickety split, lucky life released. Her toes widen on the wooden threshold, shaved three times with his different, three different sized scythes over three winding weeks, her steel wool heels bear down, down on the well-buttered heart pine, taking the wood in like cornbread poured out on a hot griddle, while just behind her, the pig iron smokes. And the last poem, before I read it, I 
must say something about this book and this publisher and how different this ride is as a writer from all the other books I've ever written. And the reason for that really sits with one person, and that's Parnesha Jones. Parnesha hounded me for two full years. Okay, not hounded. <laughs> What's a word? Let's see. Called, emailed, wrote me, talked. And at the end of those two years, I really felt like there was somebody who wanted to take this work that I cared so much about, who knew the work herself and would hold it tight and handle it right. And publishers can let you down. It's a part of the whole thing. But please let me say that everything she said she would do, she did. And I'm very, very um, thankful that you persisted and, um, and, and that we're here now uh, two weeks after the first run uh, we've run out of books, and so we've, 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 we've had a really great start, and, I, and all of that is because Parnish has been at the helm and really watching over what happens with this book, and I couldn't ask for more, so thank you for that, Parnish. This last poem, and then we'll sit down and have some conversation. Um, my, we finally got my young, younger brother married. We've been trying to do that for a long time. <laughs> and it just so happens, you know, again, you never know where there's a poem. So I go home to the wedding and after the wedding, there's a reception. And my youngest brother's wife is from Edgefield, South Carolina, which is also the home of Strom Thurmond, the state's rights senator um, from South Carolina. Little did I know as we stood with plastic champagne glasses that Senator Strom Thurmond would arrive at the wedding and would proceed to dance with all of the black women there. And I stood up on the high level of the um, building and watched this happen and knew I would write something. I wasn't sure quite what. But th this is the intersection. I was, at the time, on the plane down to South Carolina, I had been reading this wonderful um, essay by Professor Vlock at Duke, who was talking about Southern architecture and the crucial importance of, of enslaved um, um, artistry to porches in the South. And so this poem is the intersection of that essay and that moment, and it's called Dancing with Strom. And two epigraphs begin this one. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there's not enough troops in the army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and accept the Negro, pronounced nigra, into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, into our churches. Strong Thurmond, South Carolina senator and presidential candidate for the States Rights Party, 1948. I said I'm going to fight Thurmond from the mountain to the sea. Majeska Monteith Simpkins, civil rights matriarch, South Carolina, 1948. The youngest has been married off. He is as tall as Abraham Lincoln. Here on his wedding day, he flaunts the high spinning laugh of a newly freed slave. I stand above him, just off the second floor landing, watching the celebration unfold. Uncle cousins, bosom buddies, convertible cars of nosy paramours, strolling churlish penny pinchers pour onto the mansion estate. Below, Strom Thurmond is dancing with my mother. The favorite son of South Carolina has already danced with the giddy bride and the giddy bride's mother. More women await, Easter dressy, drenched in caramel, double exposed, triple cinched, lined up, leggy, ready. I refuse to leave the porch. 
If I walk down, I imagine he will extend his hand, assume I, is, I am next in his happy, darky line, number four, 427 on his dance card. His history and mine, burnt cork and blackboard chalk, concentric, pancaked, one face, two histories, slow dragging, doing the nasty. My father knows all this. My father's eyes are a black father's beacon, searchlights blazing for the married off sons and the unmarried whale-eyed nose in book daughter, born unmoored, quiet, yellow, strategically placed under hospital lights to fully bake, the one with the most to lose. There will be no trouble. Still he chain smokes, a burning stick of mint and Indian leaf seesaws between his lips. He wants me to remember that trouble is a fire that runs like a staircase up, then down. I remember the new research just out, what the Negro gave America, chapter 9,026. <laughs> Enslaved Africans gifted porches to North America. Once off the boats, they were told then made to build themselves a place to live. They build a house that will keep them alive. Rather than be the bloody human floret on yet another southern tree, they imagine high ground. They build landings with floor enough to see the trouble coming. Their arced imaginations nail the necessary out into the floral air. On the backs and fronts of 20 penny houses, a watching place is made for the ones who will come tipping with torch and hogtie through the quiet woods, hoping to hang them as decoration in the porcupine hair of longleaf. The architecture of black people is sui generis. This is architecture dreamed by the enslaved. Their design will be stolen. Their wits will outlast gold. My eyes seek historical rest from the Kiss Kiss Theater below. Strom Thurmond's It's Never Too Late to Forgive Me Chivalry. I'd search the tops of pine while my fingers reach, catch, pinch my father's determined to rise smoke. Long before AC, African people did the math, how to cool down the hot air of South Carolina. If I could descend without being trotted out by some rough rider driven by his submarine dreams, this is what I'd take my time and scribble into the three-tiered white creme wedding cake, filibuster, states' rights, the grand inquisition of the great Thurgood Marshall. This wedding reception would not have been possible without the Civil Rights Act of 1957, opposed by you-know-who. The Dixiecrat senator has not worn his sandy seersucker fedora to the vows. The top of Strong Thurmond's bald head reveals a birthmark tattooed in contrapposto pose, segregation forever. All my life he has been the face of hatred, the blue eyes of the Confederate flag, the pasty bald of white men pulling woolly heads up into the dark skirts of trees, the sharp, slobbering, amber teeth of German shepherds still clenched inside the tissue-thin, still marching, band-leader legs of black school teachers, the single-minded pupa growing between the legs of white boys crossing the tracks, ready to force black girls into fifth-grade positions, Palmetto State sec sanctioned Sex 101. I don't want to dance with him. My young cousin arrives at my elbow, her beautiful lips the color of soft-skinned mangoes. She pulls, teasing the stitches of my satin bridesmaid gown. You better go on down there and dance with Strom while he still has something left. I don't tell her that it is unsouthern for her to call him by his first name as if they are familiar. I don't tell her to bear witness to marriage is to believe that everything moving through the sweet wedding air can be confidently left to love. I stand on the landing, high above the beginnings of love, holding a plastic champagne flute, drinking in the warm June air of South Carolina. I hear my youngest brother's top hat joy. Looking down, I find him deep in the giddy crowd, modern, integrated, interpretive. For 10 seconds, I consider dancing with Strom. His Confederate hands touch every shoulder, finger, back that I love. I listen to the sound of black laughter shimmying. All worry floats beyond the gurgling submarine bubbles, the white railing, the champagne air. I close my eyes and Uncle Freddy appears out of a baby's breath of fog. The dead are never porch bound. 
He moves with ease where I cannot. He walks out on the rice thrown air, heaving a lightning bolt instead of a wave. Suddenly there is a table set, complete with 1963 dining room stars. They twinkle, twinkle up behind him. Thelonious, Martin, Malcolm, Nina, Dakota, all mouths Negro wide and open have come to sing me down. His tattered almanac sleeps curled like a wintering slug in his back pocket. His dark Dogon eyes jet to the scene below, then zoom past me until they are lost in the waning Sujilite sky. Turning in the shadows of the wheat fields, he whispers a truth plucked from the forward, tucked in his back pocket. Veritas, he says, black people will forgive you quicker than you can say Orangeburg Massacre. History does not keep books on the handiwork of slaves, but the enslaved who built this big house long before I arrived for this big wedding knew the power of a porch. This native necessity of nailing down a place for the cooling off of air in order to lift the friendly, the kindly, the so politely, the in lovely, jubilantly into the arms of the grand peculiar for the greater good of the public spectacular, us giving us away. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Mm. I, I asked this one to be here. I, I asked her to come and do this because I love her work so much. Mm. Um, I love her self so much. How, you, how she walks the earth. Uh, there's an old Mark Twain uh, quote that says, what's not in the person can't be in the work. Mm. That's a paraphrase, but that's how I feel about her. That's how I feel about you. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah. I, um, I talked to Nikki a couple days ago and said, um, you know, I'm so excited and nervous. Mm. And, and um, I just want to honor, honor you and the work. And Nikki said, you know, we'll be, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. And I thought, OK. Nikki said, we'll be fine. <laughs> we'll be fine. Um, but when you were telling the story of um, Nikki Giovanni, I, I was looking back at some emails. And we met in 2003. Mm. And I was looking at an email that you, you sent me. And I remember at Cave Canem, I remember, that, I mean, a lot of people have a story about that Cave Canem with Nikki in yeah. 2003. And um, I remember you saying very seriously, what do you want to do? Mm. What do you want to do with this work? What do you want to do? Yeah. And what you were asking was something very, very big. And it took me, I think, a year. It took me a long time to respond. Yeah. Um, and you said to me, you sent me an email. I, we eventually, I sent you the manuscript to, and asked if you would look at some things. And you sent me an email that said, crows in the vineyard, but the grapes are sweet. Which makes me think it's a version of, of, the, of the red. Yeah. Um, and I've been thinking of your um, beginning and thinking of the dedication to Miss Lucille mm. and then the word veritas. Mm -hmm. And this idea of instructions and help. Yeah. I wondered if you could say something about instruction, Tony K. Bambara. Yeah, Cheryl walked in. Hi, Cheryl. And I called your name out. You weren't here yet. Mm -hmm. But um, I had to walk through the earth and find my teachers. Mm -hmm. They weren't all in one place. And so that was a journey. And, but when you, when, you, when, you, when, you're, when you really want to do something, and when your heart is set on that, and when your mind is set on that, and your feet are set on that, you will find those things if you are walking out in the world with your heart in the right place. It, it, it sounds like it's simple. It's not. Because then you have to go back and really ask yourself, 
is your heart in the right place? Do mm -hmm. you want this for the right reasons? Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But once I had made up my mind, I just had to like move from point A to point B. It was like a map. And I didn't know where I was going. Mm -hmm. But in, in many ports, there was somebody with their hand open saying, do this, come this way, take, put this in your pocket. And I had come from people like that. I'd come from a community that always put an orange in your pocket or some peppermint. And when, you know, it wasn't a big thing, but it was that and a, a look in the eye and a, a phrase. And I trusted that. And I trusted what was being given to me. Because I didn't come from a community that talked about going to school. You learn to write, and then you did other things. You didn't learn to write, and then learn to write, and then learn to write. <laughs> <laughs> I had amazing English teachers as a child who would not let me do certain things until I learned those rules. So I had the rules. I just didn't know what else to do and how to go out into the world to do that. So I had to trust and I had to move. And you have to move around as a writer. Hmm. You can't stay home. You got to move. You got to go around. You got to leave home, pack a suitcase, get a blazer. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to have a pin, but you, you need a blazer. Because <laughs> you're going to have some jeans and you got to like, you know, dress them up and have a little suitcase with a handle and stickers on it. And have a little spinning chains that you put in your wallet where you, my father calls it death money. Mm. So you can get to the bus station or make a call to somebody. But you've got to leave home and you've got to go out in search of who you are. Mm -hmm. um, that's really important. That, I'm, I have an autodidactic path. I had to figure out how to do that. And you know, I remember, um, well, anyway, I'll, I'll come back to that. Well, Cornelius Edie is here, and I love Cornelius. And before Cave Canem, I would see Cornelius on the periphery of, you know, doing what I was, he was doing it. Mm -hmm. I was trying to do it. But he was like hammering away at, you will let me in, I will be here. And I was like, yeah, see, you got to have a hammer, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Blazer, hammer, your list is being, you know, constructed by how observant you are in the world. Mm -hmm. And I loved his work and I didn't know him. And I think the first time I saw Cornelius was at AWP and he was brilliant and, and, and determined. And you just like pinch off a piece of that and you put it in your pocket and you say, okay, now where do I do? What, which direction do I go in? So I'll, because I had done that and because people had been out there for me, I had to pass that to you. Mm. It, would, it would be like breaking the cycle of the spell <laughs> if I didn't. <laughs> and you have to do that. <laughs> she, but you know that. A lot of people don't know that. They just get it and they hold on to it. <laughs> but you have to pass it on. Mm. That's how the power stays with you and that's how the power grows. Mm. Which is why I, I brought your, I was thinking of manifestos and artist statements and, and sharing news um, with, with students. And I was with this book, mm. you know, since February 1st. Mm. And um, beginning with the do not leave the arenas to the fool. Yeah. And having you share Tony K. Yeah. Bar's work with us. But then you in the book with instructions. Yes, at the end. Yeah. At the end, yeah, you have. Uh, I'm a teacher. I didn't know that for a long time, but I come from teachers. I love the classroom as a um, arena mm -hmm. to open hearts and to to um, have that conversation that can change a mind or mm -hmm. or enlarge a heart in in the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, something you said that it made me think about something about Tony Cade and. I've, I've said this story before, and it's a, another one of those stories that matters to me, but I was sitting at her feet in her Pomoja writing workshop in Atlanta, and we, we would walk to the bus stop because Tony wasn't driving at the time, and this, this older man stopped her one day, and he said, you're that writer lady, and she said, and I, she said, yeah, I am. And I thought, oh, he wants her autograph. He's going to like do what people do when they say that, right? And he said, 
Well, my name is John Smith, and I'm a bus driver. And me and my wife are trying to buy a house. But mm. I can't write. I can't mm. figure this out. This, this, this house application is too complicated for me. And since you're a writer, mm. you say you're a writer, mm. let's see you write something. Mm. Mm. And I was like, at first, I was like, what? <laughs> this is Tony K. Bambara. <laughs> she can't fill out a house application. Mm. And she was like, 4 o'clock, Saturday. I live at the top of the hill up there. Mm. Be on time. Mm. 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 Do you? Responsibility. Mm. Um, What's, what's your sense? Do you feel responsible to anything to, how does responsibility live in your work or in, when thinking of your life? It, it makes me, a, I don't really like um, role model. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really like that so much. I, I am responsible and I'm kind and I'm, um, I work really hard. So those things I hope come out in my work and come out in my relationships with people. Mm -hmm. That's enough for me mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. live what I say I am, mm -hmm. to be what I say I am, mm -hmm. and for those who are close to me to know that. Mm -hmm. But I don't mm -hmm. feel like I have to give up my life for something else or give up my passions for what they are. I, I really feel like far too often we do that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I can be myself. It's been a long journey of understanding that. Mm. But if I live my life like I feel like I should, then somebody else doesn't have to be like me. They just, but we can link arms about the right things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Mm -hmm. So I'm responsible to tell the truth about mm. the life as I see it. I'm responsible to work hard because my grandmother taught me that what you sign, if you put your name on something, mm. then it has to represent you. Mm. And if you, that's an old way. Mm -hmm. But if I put my name on this book, then it represents who I am. It has to. So mm -hmm. everything has to be worked till it's just so. Mm -hmm. And I, that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. When I was reading the, the Poets and Writers interview, it's, it's up now. Is that right? Is it the April, yes. the April issue? Um, I was, the story that you, that you share about your grandmother mm. asking. Oh, yeah. If you could sh share that. And then also say why, why you said. Oh, my gosh. What you said. After Rice, after the second book, my grandmother called me to her kitchen table, her Formica beautiful blue table. Mm -hmm. where the sugar bowl was always in the center. And she said, OK, you wrote your little two books. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. Done. It's enough. Stop. Promise me this is the last book. Promise you? You are get, this is it. You have said everything that needs to be said. <laughs> and I, I, it was the first time in my life I couldn't, prom, I couldn't promise her what she wanted me to promise her. And what I realized, not in that moment, but shortly thereafter, was that she felt I was getting too close to saying mm -hmm. the things that I was saying, and she was afraid for me. Mm -hmm. And she didn't, she knew she was getting older and she could not be with me. Mm. She could not protect me from the things I was saying. And she knew she was not gonna be here much longer. She was very wise in that way. And so she was like, cut it off, stop. And that was the only way she could fully protect me from what she saw coming my way if I continued. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And she turned and she left the room and was mad and didn't call me for like two weeks. But we got back mm -hmm. on the path. 
and we never talked about it again. Mm -hmm. And when I, when this, right before this book came, came out, I thought about that and I thought, oh, she really wouldn't like this book. <laughs> 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 this is really, um, but you know, I talked to her all the time and I still hear her uh, moving through my mind and my heart and I know she knows that I have to do what I have to do and mm -hmm. throws me blessings from, from the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. When I was listening to you, um, I told my sister bef before we came, a couple hours before we came, I said, I just have to read these words all again. Mm. Um, and it occurred to me for the first time, and I'd spent a lot of time mm. with these poems, but it occurred to me for the first time when I was um, today reading these poems again. Um, that book looks a little ratty. <laughs> <laughs> ratty with my love. In the best way. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, Sorry. No, no. That's a blessing. Um, there's a, there are these turns in Dancing with Strom, and then mm. later I, I want to hear you talk about um, the title poem. But mm. these turns that I'm like, I'm, I'm living with this book, I'm living with this book. How did I not notice that turn? How mm. did, that turn, when you see the uncle mm. and Malcolm, mm. and, um, your vision, I, f I f feel and see that you see and it happened as you were reading. Um, the room starts to fill up, and I feel like people come. Mm, mm. Um, the air changes, it gets thicker. Mm. And that poem, your vision, your ability, I mean, to see color, mm. and also just the different realms. I wonder if there's something you could say about those turns and the scene and when you well, I come from people who can fly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've always felt that. I've always known that. And I've always been told that. And so, you know, there was a, a review that came out recently on the head off and split um, about someone said something about magical realism. And I thought, mm, I just, I come from stories about African people who took off and <laughs> um, I believe them. Mm -hmm. um, I come from the country. I come from dark skies where your imagination had uh, room to move around. Mm -hmm. um, I say all the time that it was the wandering around on my grandparents' farm at the top of the state in South Carolina that really gave me permission to dream as a, not just as a child, but as a young woman, as an older woman, I still go back there. Mm. We, you have, I need space to do that. And because I knew my history, because stories about um, what happened to us once we were here, what happened to us as we got here, filled my heart and my head. And I still try to talk about the power and magic the ability of black people to ascend mm -hmm. and um, be many things at once. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, mm -hmm. it's not a, it's no, no, nothing that I feel about black people is one dimensional, nothing. Mm -hmm. Everything is, is tiered and layered and um, real, not magical, real mm -hmm. in the things that we have had to do and had to be in order to be still here. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, how did you, I mean, I think about workshops, I think about navigating spaces where people don't always speak the same languages. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an important thing. Um, did you ever s second guess the vision? Um, how did you stay close and continue to stay close to you? 
it's all I knew. Mm -hmm. It was either breathe and march forward into this life that I embraced, or I, being, not being who I am is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm. Not being who I am is unacceptable. It was unacceptable at 14. Mm. It was unacceptable at 13, which is one of the reasons why, you know, conversations, people often ask me, especially with this book, well, how can you mix such politically charged poems mm. with, you know, family poems, with intimacy, with, how can you do that? We've always been told you can't do that. You can't put politics Mm. But I, I was born in 57. I was raised by folks in the black arts movement. There mm. were poets up on things, you know, doing um, soapbox poems and poems in uh, poets in cultural centers and poets in churches and poets on street corners. That was my model. Those were my standard bearers. Mm. So there was never a time when I thought you could get away from it. Every, I remember the first poetry um, reading that I gave, first book, I'm somewhere, I don't know, this old guy gets up and he goes, stop saying everything's political. <laughs> I said, everything's political. <laughs> but it's like, you know, the, 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 some houses of art don't want that P word in there. Mm. It's in there. It's, mm. it's in there. It's how I have come to know the power of my own breath. Mm. Um, and I refuse to think. Um, push me to the side. Don't buy my book. Don't come to my readings. Whatever. But I will, I will tell the story as I know it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's veritas. Mm -hmm. That's truth. Mm. And that wasn't given to me. That's just something that I was shown by the people who uh, lit the way. I read the book, and I'm so struck by how meticulous. I mean, everything feels so full of every part of the body. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm so struck by the count. I kept thinking. There are those numbers again. There are mm. those numbers again. Dates, number of people. Mm. Um, in the, the Red Velvet poem. Oh, yeah, the hems, the, the stitches. Mm -hmm. How many? Yeah. And I, like, all the way through, I'm, Nikki's keeping count. <laughs> um, these numbers keep showing their faces. Mm. Um, and I, the research. I know that must have gone into the life experience, the research, just the, the work yeah. all over. I'm like, work, work, work. Um, when Toni Morrison says that a writer counts her words, mm -hmm. counts. She counts how many words she uses. Or a writer counts you know, when mm -hmm. she's working. I, I, believe, I knew that before, but it affirmed mm -hmm. that truth for me. Mm -hmm. You have to count. Keep up. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Maybe we should. Should we ask anybody out here if they have any question? Could we do? Toshi would have the first mm. hand in the air. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I, I want to thank you for mm. this evening. It's really great. Um, I kind of had, you know, a little bit of not about the counting, but um, you're, you know, you're, the, the way you you uh, Zooming around the landscape of mm. a complete universe. Mm. Complete, like, mm. you're such a complete poet. I've mm. always thought that about you, and uh, I, there's never anything missing. Mm. And you remind me of um, Octavia Butler, mm. the way she, you know, I, I'm sure mm. I'm, I'm, when I read this book, I'm going to line up all your books and read them, mm. you know, together in chronological mm. order because I'm sure I'll have that same kind of dizzy thing when I'm. Read, read three or four book. of Octavia's books mm. in a row. It's like a complete universal uh, Bible pattern map, something that is just so wide. Mm. You know, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know your craft, yeah, and mm. how you mm. 
you know, explore all right. of that because it's, mm -hmm. it is immense. Yeah, I, it, it's, to me it's really simple. It goes back to that whole, how do you do this, teaching yourself how to do it. I'm a, I love reading, and I love reading, you know, botanical guides from the 18th century <laughs> and, you know, how to fix a car engine. And so I'm really curious about all kinds of things. And so I read really wide, far and wide. And so I think that love of reading and love of language and love and curiosity about the world. You know, far too often writing teachers tell you, just read this and just write this and stay right here and stay in this lane and learn metaphor and simile and, you know, adjectives and throw your adverbs away and that. No, read like everything. Hmm. And then look at you know how it was written and what you love about it and what sparks in you know the in the 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 final four uh, catalog. Well, maybe not the final four catalog, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Just read everything, and I think that's the, really the best information. I I was a child who did that. I was a child who read my father's legal briefs and mm -hmm. tried to figure out how he did that. He was a beautiful writer mm -hmm. of those things, and I I read comic books. I loved comic books. I loved the compression and the, you know. But as a, as a writer, what I really care about is I want you to see what I'm talking about. Mm. I, want, I want it to be a visual experience. Mm. I love photography. But I really want you to see the words and see the, the story, that I'm, the face, the grief, all of that. And I'm, mm. I don't paint. I'm not a painter. But I, I do feel somewhat like a visual artist because that's a responsibility that I feel like I have is to, I want them who have come to listen to see what I'm talking about. I can at least give them a visual. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are we, are we going too long? Do we need to, a few more minutes? Okay. Janisha Watts. Student from Kentucky, left Kentucky, is now in New York City. Freelance writer, Essence Magazine, Time Magazine, just left us behind. I'm so proud of you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Now you like put me on the spot. No, so I have like so many questions. So just I one. Just, yeah, no, I know. I'm narrowing on one question. I know her. I can say that. On one question. Um, no, like the um, the thing that like struck me the most, I guess, is like just your interest in um, kind of Lisa Rice and mm -hmm. like what was it about um, like what like if you can just kind of I guess expand on that, just like your interest and I just was I thought no one had really written below the surface. Mm -hmm. I thought everybody was writing about you know the reacting to her and not really yeah. taking the things that make her who she is and. You know, part of why I love being a writer is like I get fascinated about things. I get fascinated and I get curious and I want to know more, so I have to do some research. I read an amazing biography about her by Marcus, um, can't think of the name, his last name, but just found out a lot of really interesting things, things about her father, who, how, why he left the South, those kind of stories. You know, in, in America, we get the sound bite. Hmm. I hate the sound bite. The sound bite and the sound bite and the sound bite. I want the backstory. I want the history. I want the profile, the landscape, all of that. That's what I have to be curious about as the artist because I am trying to write about some truth. And so it wasn't really anything big. It was just I got curious about her life and wanted to know more. And out of that always comes a poem. Yes. The first Yari Yari, and um, I had written a book called Raw Air, mm. and I was so nervous, but I was determined to give it to you, mm. and I did, and you wrote me back the most beautiful letter, mm. and it has encouraged mm. me to keep writing, and I just wanted to thank you for that. She taught me that. I know. <laughs> mm. if, if you write, no, don't write her, but if you write Nikki Giovanni, <laughs> she will write you back. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. People don't do that, you know? Mm. People say, oh, I'm so busy, I can't write back. Mm. It matters when you get a response. Life mm. is about responding. You don't have to be a, does not be a dissertation, but <laughs> it should say, I got your words. Mm. Keep going, you know? So, 
Yes. Hi. Hi, my name is Nicole. And uh, um, I read the Poets and Writers interview, um, and you spoke about writing about your sexuality. Like, that was one of the hardest things that you actually started to um, write about as of late. Yeah. And so I, wanted, I want you to explain, like, or, you know, tell me what the process was like for you finally deciding to, like, write about that. Uh, gray hair, um, old age, um, coming to terms, coming to a sweet place with my mother. Because every time I would talk about my sexuality to my mother, she would cry. And I just couldn't, you know, it was just like breaking her heart. And I was like, Mom, I'm still me. Everything about me is the same. <laughs> and so we would go through this, you know, but it, it just took time. And, mm. you know, I've never been one of those people to think that I have to do what you want me to do when you want me to do it. Whether there's a revolution or a movement or whatever, I have to get there on my own. Mm. And the more I got to, understand that and the more I would go and hold my mom and say I'll be back I'm still the same person you know everything's gonna be okay she would you know lament but she was still there and that's the thing as long as I knew she would be there in my family I became I came um, to understand it much more closer to me than it had been before so it's process mm -hmm. everybody gets there in a different time and everybody gets there in a different way about different things and I'm, I, I don't have any um, sorrow about that. I'm, you know, plus, you don't know this yet, but when you turn 50, <laughs> you, get, you shed stuff that you just, you don't even worry about anymore. You're just like, what? <laughs> 50 is the most amazing age. Can I testify, anybody? <laughs> See, CNN won't tell you that. They'll tell you your, <laughs> your skin is going to, you know, change and your legs are going to, you know, change and sell you like 50 is the most freeing moment. Just hold on. If you can hold on. <laughs> so, listen, I've, I saw, you know, at the end of the book, there's this lovely um, uh, quote by a philosopher that I love. And I... I really wanted it to, to be put here. It's by Simone Weil. And it says, absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. Hmm. Absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. And that's what I feel like you've given us. Mm -hmm. And so I, we thank you for coming tonight. Mm -hmm. We've got some books. Arasini says books in the back. Thank you. Thank you.